message. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to lead me in what it is that you want to say. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite Lauren up to read our first scriptures today. I didn't get time to review this like I would like to. We've been running all over Lucas and Marion County trying to find Walter King's visitation. And uh, I feel so sorry for Diane and losing Walter. Let's hear the word of the Lord. John chapter 12, and we want to read verse 12 through 16. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast... When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when they had found a young donkey, sat, sat him thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on a donkey's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they the, that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him, the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for doing that. Um... I'm going to read one more piece of scripture here. I'm going to read that piece of scripture that's referenced there um, in what uh, Lauren read. It comes from Zechariah chapter 9, um, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Amen. I just love how the scriptures just all weave together. And this week was so, well, I had started on this week's sermon a while ago, but then I started going back through it as this week started coming on. And it was just so amazing to me, you know, how God just weaves through those scriptures and he tells us all that we need and, and it just goes through the Old Testament, New Testament and, you know, it just everything. I love finding those, those places where it just kind of goes back and forth. I wanted to touch um, the last scripture um, that Lauren read in John. Bring that verse back up real quick. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about them and that these things had been done to him. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things. Only after. Sometimes things don't make sense until the ending, right? Right? People or situations don't always seem to be who or what they are. And I say, I don't think we always know who we think we are or what we think we are. Today, I wanted us to have palm branches. And this was a whole other story of how I got these. <laughs> I wanted us to have palm branches because the teacher in me goes... Some of our learning is through the visual, some of it is through listening, and some of it is through feeling. And I wanted us to be able to feel these in our hands. 
Palm branches in the Greek and Roman world symbolize goodness and victory, as in there's a victory. We have won a war. And when they cried Hosanna, that meant, you know, save now, save us now. Through their actions and their words, their waving of their palm branches and their words, we know that Jesus kind of knew what it was that they were wanting. And Jesus had, God had this far better plan than what they ever thought they needed, right? He thought, they thought that he was going to come in and overthrow the Roman government. After raising Lazarus from the dead, they wanted to treat Jesus like an earthly king. But we all know that Jesus was far, well above anything that an earthly king was going to do. Jesus rode in on a donkey. Donkeys were symbolizing peace. And something I didn't know is important people apparently rode in on donkeys. I want us to read um, out of Luke real quick. In Luke's version of this, there's the last couple of verses in that. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Jesus wept realizing what they wanted to happen and realizing that they needed more than they even realized they needed. Now, the juxtaposition of this to me, the people waving palm branches, which symbolize victory and wanting a victory against the Roman government, and they're screaming, Hosanna, save now. And Jesus is riding in on a donkey, symbolizing peace just kind of like the juxtaposition of our scriptures today. In John, they think he's coming to save us from government oppression. In Zechariah stating, he will proclaim peace to the nations. And it goes on to say, our scripture from Zechariah went on to say, I will free your prisoners from a waterless pit. I want us to keep that in mind today. To me, what I see here is somewhat the same situation today. Looking for a religion to overthrow what is unjust or what we perceive as unjust. And waiting for a Messiah to come to earth screaming, save us now. All while our Messiah is really trying to bring peace through his actions and in trying to restore peace and wholeness to this earth, extending it to all, like we spoke about last week. They wanted salvation in an earthly sense, um, saving from earthly things surrounding them. They wanted things to be easy for them. What Jesus was bringing was a wholeness, a bringing us back into alignment with our relationship with God. And the Jewish practice The use of palm branches were very different than the Greek and Roman world. They took these palm branches and rejoiced before the Lord seven days during the Feast of the Tabernacles. And it wasn't just palm branches. They had an array of branches that they would put in a specific order. And these things were all very symbolic to the different relationships they saw between Jesus and other Jews, or between God and other Jews, sorry. They placed these all together to show that they were, in, they were interested in a full relationship with God. They weren't interested in just serving God one way. What I find interesting was the palm branches, just the palm branches in this bouquet that they would wave for seven days. Symbolized, and I had Adam put this up here so we can see it, those who study the Torah but do not possess good deeds. 
Oh, they said that the palm branches have taste, but no smell. And that's the reason why they symbolized it that way. Now, I don't, you do not have to taste your palm branches. <laughs> you can smell them if you want to, but you do not have to taste them. I will take their word for it. I thought about it today, but I thought, no, no, I'm not going to. <laughs> palm Sunday is, has very much to do with the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Feast of the Tabernacle is what they would, where they would wave this bouquet of different branches. And at the beginning of the scriptures we read today, or that Lauren read today, it said, and the next day the great crowd had come for the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. This festival was the Feast of the Tabernacles. The feast in the, of the tabernacles was not in the Jewish mind of victory, but about God seeing them through to praise God for whom is the provider. This festival end, or marked the end of the harvest time or the agricultural year in the land of Israel. Now, the Feast of the Tabernacles was a commemoration of all that God had done for the people as they passed through the wilderness. And I found this in my, it, the way that, that uh, it was worded in one of the um, books that I read. They said, the way which the Lord their God had led them. They had passed through drought and desert, foes and fears, and found occasions for rejoicing and thankfulness. The festival was the feast of inheriting consequences and a feast of remembering the past. Another name for the feast of the tabernacles is this word, <laughs> Sukkot. I don't even know how to pronounce this, which means booths or tents. It's a commemoration of when they lived in tents during those 40 years. This was also a reminder that at some time God was going to come and to tabernacle again with his people. They went through the desert, but in the distance, they knew something was coming. The Feast of the Tabernacles also reminded them of the hope of the coming age when God would once again come and tabernacle with them. Now with the Feast of the Tabernacles, there's a few ceremonies I want us to think about that might help us better understand the scriptures around the feast a little better and the scriptures surrounding the verses we recite on Palm Sunday. And I wanted to real quickly bring these up. Uh, in the Feast of the Tabernacles, there was a ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple. And in this ceremony, they would light four golden oil-fed lamps in the court of women, and these lamps were about 75 feet high, with light so bright that it is said to have illuminated the entire city. And this was a reminder of the pillar of light that led them through the desert. This ceremony would have happened not too long before Jesus made a declaration in John 8, because we read in John 7 that the, that was the last day of the festival. And so when Jesus says in John 8, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This would have just happened. Jesus is saying, follow me. I am that light. I am that Shekinah glory of God that you are wanting. Amen. Now let's back up to John 7, the last day of the festival. On the last day, the priests would come down from the temple and fill their golden vases at a fountain, bringing the water back up to the temple and pour it through the temple courts. And they would chant, with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. Now let's read this scripture in John 7. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Can you imagine Jesus saying that as water is pouring down around him? Hmm. 
Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow through them. At this point, God's people were in a drought. And I mean a lot more when I say that than just what we think of as a drought today. They needed water for their crops, but they needed it for their lives. They needed new life to spring up from the dry, dusty ground. They needed to water seeds within themselves with Jesus that weren't getting water. They needed the spirit of the living water, and they needed Jesus to usher in what we call the age of the spirit. They didn't know he would do this in this way, so they didn't believe it. And still to this day, some of God's people are still in a drought. And I challenge our thought if we don't think that we are sometimes in a drought Now, John's account in Revelation brings some of this all together for us. A moment, John's account, where this, there will be this moment of celebration after God has brought us through the Feast of the Tabernacles in the Tabernacle, right? This is what it says in Revelations. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter, will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hmm. Now, we've reached that point where... If we had seatbelts, I'd tell you to buckle up. (laughs) I'll say this real quick. I won't ever apologize for what I feel that God has laid on my heart to say. But I hope you realize that what I say is out of love. There's been a lot of prayer that's gone into this. And here I am, my second Sunday in, and I go, God, do you really want me to say these things? (laughs) But I don't like to be disobedient, so here we go. This was never and will never be about us trying to line up God with the way that we think things should happen or the way we think he should do this. This has always been and will always be about us finding our way back into alignment with God's mission. God's mission is a one of restoration, one of love. God's mission involves bringing life from the dry ground. God's mission has always been about taking power away from death. These 40 days in Lent signify the 40 years of the desert or the 40 days that Jesus was tempted in by Satan. In Lent, we redirect our sight off the things that have distracted us for this last year, these unimportant things. 
In giving us up something for Lent, we are refocusing. In fasting, we are saying this is unimportant because the most important thing in my life is God. We fast our meals to redirect our thinking, not to gain anything, or to f- but to find ourselves realigning with God. In fasting meals, we are saying food, the substance for our body is unimportant because God is the most important thing. We don't fast to bring God to our ideas. We fast to bring ourselves to God. This isn't a tug of war where we are trying to win God to our side. When we align ourselves with God's mission, we see that God is interested in healing, in restoration, in salvation for all. And I'll say that again, for all and for all. And that includes the person we dislike the most. I know I touched on this last week, but I want to make another point about this this week, about the way we speak about others. When we speak negatively about someone, even someone we think or we know isn't a Christian, because look at the way they act, right? We are speaking more about what is going on in our heart than what's going on in theirs. It is out of the overflow of our heart that our mouth speaks. If we are truly realigning ourselves with God's mission of love here on earth, of restoration here on earth, of thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, then the only words out of our mouths will be from love and directed by God. And we have no right to question that. When we speak negatively about someone, we tend to what I'll say, dehumanize them. We tend to start, to start not caring about their pain, about what it, if, if they have what they need, or wh- about what they get. Hard question here. But how many of us have uttered the phrase, they deserve what they got? And we're going to come back here next Sunday and we're going to praise God that we didn't get what we deserved. When we dehumanize people, we tend to think less of, we tend to think of them less like us and more like an enemy. And we tend not to care what happens to them. This week I shared something on Facebook that was posted by Oklahoma First Church of the Nazarene that says, quote, bad theology kills. I didn't get any likes, but that's okay. It's true. (laughs) When we have bad theology where we tend to think less of people, we don't care what happens to them. We don't care if they have all they need. We don't even want to read it in the news what happens to them or watch it. This week I realized that we are back in the season of mass shootings. And we are in that because we don't think of people as people. We tend to think of people as objects as less than human, as someone we don't need to be concerned about. And we don't grieve their deaths, and we don't grieve the path that has brought us to this point. We have no right to tell God how we think this needs to be done. And if we have, then that is something we need to repent of. We have no right to tell Jesus that he must ride into town on a donkey and overthrow the government. We have no right to tell God what is important and what isn't important. We have no right to tell God how to do it. And if he says we are to love him and love others, then that's absolutely what we are called to do, no questions asked. We aren't called to be the gatekeepers of heaven 
to let some people in and not let other people. We aren't called to be the gatekeepers of this church where we are <laughs> we let some people in and not others. We don't people don't have to clean up before they come to Jesus. Because the more we set an example, the more of Jesus they see in us, the more they will desire a relationship with him. And the more they fall in love with Jesus, the more they will choose to be who he calls them to be. And I want to point this out once again and say it again, who he calls them to be, not who we call them to be. The more they fall in love with Jesus, the more they will reflect who Jesus is. As crazy as it may seem, what if extravagant love is what it takes to restore this world? Extravagant love given for all. Extravagant love that looks an awful like lot like arms stretched wide to the east and to the west what if in this extravagant love jesus asks us to pick up our own cross and carry it with him and what if we lose ourselves in the process what if in this extravagant love we are called to die to self and to show grace and compassion on those who persecute us what if extravagant love calls us to willingly give of ourselves to willingly give of our comforts for the sake of others? What if extravagant love calls us to make sure that the words coming out of our mouths are seasoned, not salty? What if extravagant love means loving extravagantly those whom we most dislike or the most we disagree with? What if extravagant love looks nothing like what we thought it did in defending our own freedoms, but in defending the freedoms of others? Amen. What if extravagant love looks nothing like making sure we have all we need and want, and more like making sure those around us have all that they need? What if extravagant love and restoration of this earth means a little less about me and a little more about thee. What if the water of the living God flowing through us and from us is what is supposed to bring life to this desolate place, one of pain, and we are just missing it because we don't want to even look at that dry, desolate place. We don't want to show grace to people like that. I mean, we know they're not Christians by the way they act. What if the living water of the Holy Spirit flowing from us is what's supposed to change the world, bringing it back to restoration? But we are so preoccupied in making sure that there's enough water for us that we aren't even looking around at the rest of the world, just ourselves. That is where we're called to repent. When we think that we know it all and know exactly what, how God is going to do this, we need to repent of this thought that God is somehow going to come down and just overthrow it all, all these unjust things. We need to repent of this thought that people just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And we need to repent of this thought that was spoken to my daughter here in Sheraton High School by a self-professing Christian teacher who said to her that if we all just took care of ourselves, ourselves, that this world would be a better place. Now, I, I do not question the way that God does things. But I have never read anywhere in this that we are supposed to take care of ourselves in this world would be a better place. <sighs> the Bible tells me that I'm, I'm supposed to take care of others. And restora restoration to all will come. I want us to 
dry out these palm branches for Ash Wednesday next year. But before we turn them in and put them back in the bucket and let them dry, I want us to break off a piece of these palm branches. A piece that we can sit somewhere, that we can be reminded that things aren't always as they seem. That we choose to give our all to God, not just a piece of us. That we want to love extravagantly. We don't want to be people who study the Bible but live in a drought because we don't use what we learn to partake in the Missio Dei, the mission of God here on earth. We don't want to be the people who study the Torah or now the Bible in its entirety but do not possess good deeds. And I'm not talking about works. We don't want to be a people who do not partake and the Missio Day. We want to be used by God for his restoration purposes. Not how we think it needs to be done, but how he wants it to be done. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this message, Lord. I really needed it on my heart this week. And Lord, I know that you've broken my heart several times this week, but I pray, Lord, that you just continue to use me, continue to use the people of this church. Lord, we really do want to partake in your mission. And sometimes that means a little bit of pain in losing parts of ourselves so that we can realign in what it is that you want us to be. Lord, I pray that you continue to, to mold us into what it is that we need to be to be used for you, for your mission, not for ours. Lord, I just pray that these attitudes we may have in our heart, that you check them. You bring these parts of us that just don't align with you and you make us look at them <laughs> and give them over to you. Lord, I just love you and I praise you. Lord, I pray that for this church that you just continue to show us the way. Show us how it is that you want us to love on people. Show us how we can partake in the Missio Day. Show us our part of this. Lord, we just love you and we praise your name. We ask these 